is a privilege, an honor, and always a bit of a nerve-wracking experience to, to share, but um, thank you for receiving me. Uh, Ryan and Sarah are away this weekend, but thank you, Ryan, for trusting me. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I'm, I am, uh, I think there's a space God's wanting me to go to today. That's that tension I feel. Um, and so we're going to go on this journey together. Uh, but I'm trusting that for some of us, a passage we may know by heart, or for some of us who are new to the Bible, a, passion that, a, a, a passage that may be new to us, um, doesn't really matter that God is going to show us something. He's going to deposit something new. Um, the beauty of God is like, it doesn't matter how many times you read the Bible or you memorize the text, there's something new every single time. And so um, I just wanna invite you into the space that I'm in. I'm in like a, what are you doing Lord space? And I, I want you guys to come with me. <laughs> One for security, but two, because I think I, <laughs> well, I'm honest, uh, but two, because I, I just, there's like an adjustment. That's, I think that's what it is. There's an adjustment to, to be made today. Um, but it, those adjustments can only be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, okay. Are we good? Are you alive? Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Is Jesus worthy of your praise? Is he worthy of your life? Those are all the right answers. Okay, let's read the text together, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump right into this. We're jumping off of Galatians 5, kind of picking up a little bit where Ryan left off a few weeks ago. And uh, while he was preaching, a few revelations came to me, and I, uh, I just said, hey, I'm, I think I'm going to pick up on that. So you, you might hear some themes, some common themes between what I'm saying and what he said, um, but... But God's going to make it all work together. So Galatians 5, starting at verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of, aid, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let, not, uh, let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you are here. And we acknowledge you, and we ask you for your help today. I pray that you would open our eyes to see 
what Jesus would want us to see in this text this morning. And I pray that any adjustments that need to be made are only made by your power. We thank you for your presence. We're expectant for what you're gonna do in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Tiff. We don't have to look too far back in recent history to realize the cultural moment that we are standing in. There have been seismic shifts over the last decade, but especially over the last couple of years. What wasn't okay a decade ago, a decade ago is, is now okay. And what, what, what isn't permissible today may not be permissible tomorrow. There is absolutely no plumb line, no guide, no rule book. It's a free for all. And we are becoming increasingly more and more moralistic, yet we lack any direction or definitions as to where we get our morals from. One writer puts it this way, we are a moral seeking culture without an absolute or divine moral law giver. We, <clears throat> we hear attitudes and statements like what I do doesn't need to involve you or it doesn't concern you if it doesn't hurt you. But ultimately, our culture seems to be on a perpetual quest of freedom and liberation. But I have one question for us in the world today. How do you define freedom? Where does your definition come from? Does it begin with yourself and end with yourself? Does it begin with what you're told is freedom? Where does your definition of freedom come from? When and where will it be found? And who approves when you're free? You see, if we don't have a destination or definition in mind, the quest for personal freedom ultimately becomes baseless and therefore endless. It's a never ending quest for something based on nothing. And so here we are in this text, Galatians 5 specifically, but the book of Galatians, as we walk through this text together, I think God is going to sort of pull the pieces together. Some of these words we use in culture, some of these words we use between each other, but maybe we don't have the right definitions behind them. I'm hoping and praying that Paul can realign our definition of what freedom is. Are you hearing me? As we read in Paul's letter to the Galatians, Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit seems to think that there is a very clear definition of freedom. So let's dig in together. So the context of this letter is a strongly worded letter. Paul is writing to a church that he helped establish. And what's happened in that time is he's left and what they call Judaizers, which are Jewish Christians have come in and they've begun to put people under the Jewish law. It was mostly a, uh, the Galatians were mostly made up of Gentiles. And as time went on, more and more Jews moved in and Jews were converting, but still under the law. And so what was happening was this conflict that Paul's hearing about where the Gentile, new Gentile Christians who understood the gospel came to faith with the gospel are now being tempted and being pushed towards trying to go back to a works based religion. And Paul writes this letter 
to establish a plumb line, to remind the Galatian church that you cannot mix works and life of the spirit. You cannot mix what Jesus has done for you and what you can try and do for yourself. It cannot be accomplished. That's why you needed the gospel in the first place. This is a strongly worded letter. You have passages like Galatians 1.6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into co confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. That's strong. Galatians 3.1, you foolish Galatians. <laughs> when was the last time someone called you foolish? You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you or who's put you under a spell? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. A strong language. And Paul uses this language and lays out his case for there being no need or basis for a believer to prove oneself by way of the law, but to hold fast to the work of Christ through his free gift of salvation. Are you with me? So now we find ourselves in Galatians chapter five. It's like the turning chapter. He's built his case, Galatians one. He's, well, he's really slapped them around if we're gonna be honest. Galatians one, two, three, and four. Now we're coming into Galatians five. And he's building his case. And we're going to sit in the passages that we read together. Galatians 5, 13 through 26. So starting at verse 13 again, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. You, my brothers and sisters, when you receive Christ's gift of salvation, he sets you free. Period. No additives. No splenda. When Christ sets you free, it's a finished work. You are free from the bondage and weight and curse of sin. And you are now made alive to the reality of Christ. Earlier in Galatians 5.1, Paul says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Then he says, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Paul is laying out the contrast between abusing the liberty that we have in Christ to serving one another we see this exact pattern set by Jesus. He had more liberty than anyone who ever walked the earth. Yet he used his liberty through love to serve. In other words, remember Jesus. Remember the humble servant who came and lived and died. He had full access to do what he wanted, yet he didn't. And he used his love to serve. Don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. Are you with me? Galatians 5, 16 and 18. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh they are in conflict with each other 
so that you will, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Paul uses the language of walking with the spirit. And this is intentional as it paints the picture that the spirit is on the journey for the long haul. It doesn't say keep up with the spirit. It doesn't say sprint with the spirit. It says walk with the spirit. That should tell us that the spirit is in it for the long haul. This word walk can be translated three ways. First, it can mean that if Jesus is your Lord, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Secondly, it can mean open and sensitive, sensitive to the influence of the Holy Spirit. Third, it can mean pattern your life after the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's an important one. One commenter puts it this way. The Holy Spirit doesn't move in us to gratify our fallen desires or passion, but to teach us about Jesus and to guide us in the path of Jesus. This is the key to righteous or godly living walking in the spirit, not living under domination of the law. So suddenly this letter, strongly worded letter is starting to make more and more sense as we move along, right? Because what Paul is addressing again is a group of Christians that understood the gospel. They came to faith because of the proclamation of the gospel, but then who are being influenced by infiltrators who are trying to change the gospel. Are you with me? Galatians 5, 19 and 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. On first glance, that's a heavy, that's a heavy text. Be honest with me. Talk back to me. That's heavy. It feels heavy, right? It's a heavy list. But we, we have to read it the way that I was intended to understand what Paul is saying. Because if you just read it on face value, you'll find yourself in condemnation. Are you hearing me? What was Paul trying to say? Other translations say those that practice things uh, sorry, those that practice such things will not inherit the kingdom. The key word here is practice. Which can be translated to mean habitually done without constraint. Paul is contrasting the life of a true believer versus someone who claims to be one. The life of the true believer is life in the spirit. This list can be summed up into four categories, sexual, spiritual, sins against each other, and social sins. It's not an exhaustive list, but an exhaustive list wouldn't make a difference. It's, it's the contrast that matters. And so Paul's writing to a church that 
these are the things that they are dealing with, but that their culture is dealing with as well. We have to understand that when we approach this text. And so my question for you is, it's easy to look at this and go, oh, well, orgies and, or like factions. Who, who says factions anymore? You know, we dismiss things like that. But ask yourself, what would this li list look like if Paul was writing it to us today in Vancouver 2020? What would it look like? What are we dealing with right now? Some of you are like waiting to yell something out at me. Please don't. <laughs> are you with me? What, what, what would that list look like? A lot of similarities. There'd probably be a lot of other things on here as well. Notice that Paul puts Yes, okay, I already said that. Remember, okay, yes. So notice that Paul puts things like idolatry, debauchery, sexual immorality, hatred, and envy all in the same list. This goes back to what Ryan talked to us about a few weeks ago, how sometimes we have socially accepted sins. But he puts them all, but Paul puts them all in the same list. From the most seemingly obvious to the most innocent, Paul is trying to show the Galatian church that when we are not walking with the Spirit, or when we don't walk with the Spirit, these are the acts that our flesh will pull us towards. But the follower of Jesus, if Jesus is Lord, I want to remind you that you are born again. Flesh gives birth to flesh, Jesus said, but Spirit gives birth to spirit, John 3, 2, and 6. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You have to understand that Paul is drawing some hard lines, but he's showing the contrast of if you continue in this way of trying to earn God's love, trying to, get, uh, trying to earn God's love through you doing things, your flesh will be provoked. And what you're dealing with in the culture, you will deal with because you're trying to earn God's approval. You're trying to earn his love. That's why he makes that, those two lists. Are you hearing me? You have to, that, I need to sit there for a second. I'm not gonna move. New Christians, you must understand that. Because if you read something like this without understanding the contrast that Paul is trying to do, you'll find yourself in condemnation. It's not there for you to be condemned. It's there to invite you and warn you that if you keep trying to earn God's love through your morality or the morality of the world, you will find yourself here. Okay. Galatians 5, 22 and 26 now. But the fruit of the Spirit, and notice it says fruit. I, gr I grew up saying fruits, right? We think of them of, as fruits, or in, in, in church school, sometimes we, we take drawings of like oranges, apples, and grapes, and we write these different ones down. And that's good, it's a good way to remember it, but, it, but Paul says fruit. So it's, they're not different. It's like it's a, like a bunch of grapes. It's one fruit, but made up of many. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ 
have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. For some of us who grew up in church, this list is familiar to us. You may even know a song or two. There's some songs around that, right? Kate, I feel like you know a lot of songs about the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. We'll give you a moment maybe later. Yep. But again, notice that contrast between the flesh and the spirit. And notice in verse 24 and 25, those who belong to Christ Jesus have, past tense, not are continually, not maybe one day, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I remind you again, if you are born again, if Jesus Christ is your Lord, he has done this. Are you hearing me, church? If Jesus Christ is your Lord, he has done this in your life. He has crucified, uh, sorry, those who belong to Jesus, crucified the flesh with his passions. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This is only done through your life by way of the power of the Holy Spirit. But it is also an intentional decision by us to choose his work that's been done on our behalf. I'll say that again. This work to bring about the fruit of the Holy Spirit is done through your life by way of the Holy Spirit, but is, it is an intentional decision by us for his work to be done in our life. That's why when Ryan preaches John 15, again and again. It's not because he's out of content. Honestly, it's not because he's out of content. It's because God in his kindness, God in his grace is pushing on something right now in this church, right now in my life, right now in so many of the lives of people in this church. Abide, abide, abide. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Abide, abide, abide. The work is done by the Holy Spirit, but it's our choice on whether we engage with that or not. That's the choice that's given up to you. You don't have to earn anything that Christ has made available to you, but you have the choice to receive it. Are you with me? All right, let me slow down. That was a lot. How are we feeling? (laughs) Thanks, Brad. All right, so what are we going to do with all of this? What do we do with this information? How does it uh, apply to me? These are good questions to have. And so I want to look at three observations from this text that I think we need to consider as we move forward from here. Are we ready? Number one, the flesh is provoked by the law. Galatians 2.15 says this, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law. But through faith in Jesus Christ, so we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because 
By works of the law, no one can be justified. By works of the law, no one can be justified. The whole point of the law was to show you the perfect nature of God. The law was perfect, but it couldn't convert your soul. I'll say that again. The law reflects the perfect nature of God. It is perfect, but it couldn't convert you. No one can be justified by the law. So therefore, your awareness of sin, and everybody has this, Romans 1 talks about this, an awareness of sin, that everybody has, whether you're a believer or not, there is an intangible knowing of what is right and wrong, and an awareness of God, an awareness of who he is, his bigness, and and what he expects, but we suppress that sometimes. But when we come to Christ, it's made obvious to us. The law makes us sin aware, but it does not help us with our condition. And so we fall into this deadly cycle. We're boastful. I'm doing well. Then we fall. And then we try to self-save ourselves. And then we give up and then we indulge. And over and over and over again. I'm doing well. Ah, oh, I messed up. I'll fix myself. I can't fix myself. I indulge and indulge and indulge. And that's, that hits home for me. I found myself there. That deadly cycle of doing well, falling, struggle, indulge. This is, this is why the invitation to life in the spirit is crucial for us to understand. Because whether you are religious or you are far away from God, if this is your deadly cycle, it's because you're it's trying to attain freedom and liberty through your own means. And it won't work. Are you hearing me? It won't work. The fruit of the spirit, number two, is in direct contrast to the flesh. Works are works, but the spirit and his fruit is life. Fruit has several important characteristics. Fruit isn't achieved by working, it's birthed by abiding. Fruit, isn't fr fruit is fragile and should be handled with care. It reproduces itself. Fruit is attractive, pleasing to the eye. Fruit nourishes your body. It's helpful to understand the works of the flesh in light of the love of this, in light of this love, in light of love, sorry, by way of the spirit. Each one of us, each one of these works of the flesh is a violation or a perversion of love. Sexual sins are counterfeits of love among people. Idolatry sins are counterfeit to the love of God. And sins we do against each other are all opposites of loving each other. And social sins, drunkenness, revelries, the, these are all attempts to fill a void that only the love of God can fill. Are you with me? But God wants to work on us from the inside out, not the outside in. So while we may try our best at self-control, God wants to teach us spirit control. 
abide, abide, abide. Are you hearing me? All right, number three. We must understand the role and power of Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit can be some, the, the, the Holy Spirit work in our lives can be summed up in three ways. Spirit is God, omnipotent, his bigness. He dwells over the earth. Spirit as Jesus' gift, that's where we get empowerment from, gifts of the Holy Spirit, from ministry. And the Spirit's role in shifting you. And this is the key one. The Spirit has a role in your life to shift us, to help us if we stumble, to guide us day to day to become more like Jesus. His transformative power. Spirit is God. Spirit is Jesus' gift, ministry, and power. And Spirit's role in shifting you. Transform, transformational power is experience when we walk by the Spirit. And that work walk, that word walk in the text, it means manner of, it can be translated to mean manner of life. So I say walk by the Spirit. In other ways, embody the manner of life that the Spirit is calling you into. That's his invitation. So even when we sprint ahead, way down the path, all we gotta do is walk back and the Holy Spirit's still there. And he, oh, hey, where were you? <laughs> I was walking, he was, he's still walking. I mean, go real far down, real far, too far. It may take me a long time to get back, but he's there and he'll meet me right there. And he doesn't stop. He just says, let's go. And he keeps walking. Are you hearing me? True freedom is only found in the spirit made possible by the work of Christ. That's it. There's our definition of freedom. If you belong to Christ, you're either going to be a slave to sin or a slave to Christ. Those are your options. A slave to yourself, your own passions, the passions of the world, world, or a slave to Christ and his passions and what he wants for us in our lives. Those are the two things that you get to choose. And it's your choice. It's the matrix moment. It's two pills put out before you. Which one will you take? It's just like you, you will be formed by something. <laughs> We're all being formed into an image. What image is that? And it's our choice to choose. Day to day, we get to choose. Spirit, I want what you want. Jesus, I want what you want. And I know the culture that we live in. I know the city we live in. I know. I live here too. But what God is calling his church to and what God's calling each one of us to is something that is so much greater than what the culture can give you. I feel like you, some of you just need to get that. You're in spheres or you're in worlds where you really feel that tension. Some of you may not be in that tension. But for those of you who are, like, the, the promises of God, like, the, that's where you find your life. True freedom is only found in the spirit made possible by the work of Christ. 
So what about when I stumble or fall? Remember, I, I, made, I wanted to make it very clear that Paul's making a contrast earlier in this text between those who are believers and those who may not be. But for you who are believers, Galatians 6.1 says this, If someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore them gently. Let that sink in for a moment. That even if when you do stumble, the God's reaction to you and his instruction to Paul in this church isn't to throw that person out. It's to restore them gently. Restore them gently. I think about my kids when I, when I, when I see this. Yesterday, we had to drop the hammer a bit on them. They're being crazy. Everybody went to their own rooms. And then we had a family meeting in our bedroom. And I had to say, guys, it's out of control. You're out of control. We need to get back. <laughs> we need to get back to the standard. But there's always an invitation with our kids. No matter what they do, no matter how crazy they are, no matter how much they step on my toes sometimes, come back, son. Come back, Mo. I know, I know. Come back. Let's keep going. I'm not stopping walking. You, you come with me too. Come, India. Yes, you screamed in my face. It's okay. It's okay. Come back. Let's go. Let's keep walking. Let's keep walking. Even Cannon's having his troubles now. He's not a sweet little baby anymore. He's a crazy toddler. And we put him on the stairs. You have a timeout, Cannon. And he sits there and I come back. Come, Cannon. Come. Come. Let's go. Let's keep going. Let's go on with the day. I don't stand there and lord it over them. I don't kick them out of my house. I restore them gently. Gently. And so wherever you find yourself, and team, you can come back up. Wherever you find yourself today, maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you've walked in and you're like, wow, first time in a church, this guy's preaching about sin. Or maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time. You're doing great. You're doing well. Or you're struggling. You're, you're stumbling over something. The invitation to all three of you is the same. Come. Because Paul also warns those, if we go back, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited. In other words, we're so puffed up that we're doing well. We end up provoking each other. Whether you're doing well, whether you're stumbling, or whether you're far from Christ, the invitation to all of three of those people is the exact same. Come. Come. Come back. Come. We're walking together. I'm walking. I'm not sprinting. And I'm not sprinting because you don't have to keep up with me. If anything, you're, I'm, you, you got to stay at my pace. Stay at my pace of grace. That's where you'll find your life. Stay at my pace of grace. That's where you'll find your life. Stay at my pace of grace. That's where you'll find your life. A culture that tells you that you need to look a certain way. You need to act a certain way. You need to wear certain things or you need to associate yourself with certain people. It's pushing its morality on us. But the Spirit says, come. Come, walk with me. Walk with me, I'll change your desires. Walk with me. The religious, 
that thinks they've got it all together and they're trying to make it look as if everything's okay, but internally they just feel in, at turmoil. Spirit says, come, come walk with me, come. And that's what I wanna call you guys, all of us to today. Come, it's a journey of a lifetime, but the freedom you'll find, you cannot do it yourself. It has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. So let's stand up together. Close your eyes for a moment. Yeah, thank you, Holy Spirit. Even right now, Holy Spirit. Yeah. Just begin to minister to us. Remind us again of the goodness and sufficiency of Christ his work on the cross and that you want to produce a good fruit in us that's lasting and attractive that leads us to serve one another and to serve our world invite us to walk back at your pace again May we find joy at that pace where we can quickly make an adjustment when we feel like we're sense or we see that we're going off too far. If you sense that God is ministering to you, just hold out your hands. say, Holy Spirit, I want to walk with you. And just sense him saying, come, just come. Come on, Moses, come. Let's keep going with our day. Come on, India, come. Let's keep going. Walk with me. The day continues. The day continues. The day continues. The day continues. Come. Come. Come walk with me. I've already done the work, says Jesus. The work's already been done. Let me produce fruit in your life. Come. Let me produce fruit in your life. Let's find freedom in knowing the Holy Spirit and walking with the Holy Spirit. God, would ever, anything else just have such a rancid taste in my mouth? Let's worship.